Alright. Okay. Um, this is not my most elaborate introduction to you. So, oh, okay. <laughs> Albert Jones is an assistant pr professor of philosophy at California State University, Chico. That's all I have. Okay. I don't know your projects. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you, Harlan. Thanks for waking up this morning. I think it may have been in a moment of thoughtless indiscretion that my sweet friend Harlan invited me to give a talk today. And that after I said yes, he did probably did everything in his power to have me not show up, including contacting some associates of Tanya Harding to do this to me. But I managed to make it here anyway. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, thanks again. So uh, here's my, my talk in five parts. Hopefully they'll each be six, uh, two minutes, you know, about two minutes each. Um, so this talk that I'm going to give today is actually a part of a longer paper that I'm doing that's in collaboration with my friend and colleague, Gunnar Eggerston. Um, so I want to say all and any of the good ideas in this paper are due to Gunnar, and any of the bad ones I will take responsibility for. Um, so here's, the, here's sort of the layout of my talk. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, is the, the problem of the systemic violence against animals and the role of veganism as part of this solution to the violence. And the first thing I want to talk about is the notion of veganism. Um, I think there are two notions of veganism, at least. There's one notion of veganism where if someone says they're a vegan, there's this image of the self-righteous, zealot, vegan police, and this is the person who is... Uh, you know, preaches, they're saying veganism is the only way to go, judges non-vegans as being in some way inauthentic, and non-vegans are shirking their responsibility to the cause. This is the, these are the kind of vegans that, um, that I avoid myself. Um, but there's another sense of vegan that I want to talk about, and that is what I call vegan sub two. Um, and this is where you see veganism as an, kind of an endless work in progress. A process of doing the best one can to minimize damage, minimize violence, exploitation, domination, and objectification wherever and whenever we can. On this view, veganism is not a lifestyle, but rather what eco-feminist philosopher Lori Gruen calls an aspiration. So it's an aspiration, and that's the sense that I want to talk about it. I have observed an interesting trend in animal studies, namely a reaction against or rejection of veganism. I believe that the issues that my animal studies colleagues have with veganism stem in large part from a reaction against veganism one, the reaction that I share. However, today I want to talk not about veganism one, but veganism two. Not only do I want to talk about it, I want to advocate it. But before I do that, let me digress for a moment and relate an experience. At a recent casual gathering of animal studies friends, we went around the table asking the question, what's your favorite animal? In reply, one friend reported that he, quote, loved bunny rabbits because they're so cute and because they taste so good. This comment got me thinking. I started to wonder, what does it mean both to love animals and to eat them? I was reminded of a speech given by the great social reformer Henry Salt at the meeting of the London Vegetarian Society in 1931, a meeting at which Henry Salt shared the podium with Mahatma Gandhi. Salt ended his speech that day by noting, quote, it is difficult to maintain perfect love for animals so long as we continue to eat them. In this brief talk, I want to suggest that if we are sincerely dedicated to doing our best to minimize violence, exploitation, domination, and objectification, wherever and whenever we can, then we should do good to match our behaviors to our rhetoric and aspire to be vegan too. Part two, the many ways of engaging argument. Follow along. One common argument I hear from my colleagues is what I call the veganism is just one way among many of engaging ethically with animals argument. This argument centers around issues of industrialization and production, and it goes something like this. Vegans cannot escape the cycle of industrialized violence and destruction of animals in their habitats. For example, one could be a vegan, but eat soybeans produced by Monsanto. 
or consume palm oil, contributing to the destruction of rainforests in Malaysia and Indonesia, and harming animals such as the orangutan or the tiger. So veganism is just one among many, many ways to engage ethically with animals. Therefore, though caring, compassionate people have good reason to engage ethically with animals, there's no compelling reason to privilege veganism over any of the other many ways of engaging ethically with animals. To me, this argument conflates two issues. On the one hand, is the question of veganism as part of a solution to animal violence. On the other, is our being critical and mindful of and resistant to industrialized capitalism and the consumerist system as a whole. The problems associated with the manufacture and distribution of vegan foods are separate issues from the ideology of veganism as part of a solution to the problem of human violence against animals. Though the means of production of vegan foodstuffs certainly deserves criticism, this kind of response does not in any way devalue veganism as an ethical response to violence against animals. Further, though it is true that veganism is just one way among many of engaging ethically with animals, it does not follow that one might not be morally compelled to do whatever she reasonably can to reduce violence, including avoiding Monsanto products, palm oil, and aspiring toward veganism. Part three, the killing entanglement argument. With regard to the eating of animals in particular, another argument against the need to be vegan is what I call the killing entanglement argument. Simply put, the argument goes something like this. Human beings are always entangled in violence and killing. We don't get a pass on killing. Privileging one kind of violence and killing over another misses the point. Though we strive to look at the big picture, even that is impossible because we are just so stuck inside a killing life. But this to me seems a very defeatist attitude. True, violence against animals is in fact systemic, but we should never forget that in the end, it is always also an individual violence done against an individual animal. I see no good reason why such objectification. In reality, the ultimate form of objectification, namely the literal transformation of a complex sentient being into a food object, I see no good reason why we need to honor such relations of exploitation and domination. Veganism too, the kinder, gentler veganism, is a direct, powerful, and empowering response to this enmeshed life of violence. It may not prove to be an all-encompassing solution, but it is a very clear and definite response. Part four, animals in animal studies as absent reference. The project of reconfiguring the place of the human in the world comes with ethical responsibilities. Taking dramatic steps toward destroying the human-animal binary needs to be taken to the next logical step. Change. A change of practice when it comes to our relations with other animals. To say that there are ethical consequences to changing one's worldview seems to me uncontroversial. What would it mean for theorists from other political fields, such as race and feminist theories, not to be activists as well. True, the doing of such work in the academy is itself a form of activism, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about what it would mean, for example, to do feminist theory without seeing the ethical implications of such theoretical work. That seems odd to me. I believe the same applies to animal studies. My concern is that in the academyizing of animal studies, the animal may begin to disappear as a living, breathing being. When animals start to become objectified through this kind of discourse, becoming primarily an object of academic analysis and discussion, the animal may become just another commodity, one tailored specifically to us, scholars. It is in this sense that animals become what ecofeminist Carol J. Adams calls the absent referent. Further, I believe that we animal studies folk need to extend our issues of animal study not only toward real animals, but to species other than the ones we are specifically focused on. To avoid becoming like 
so many animal lovers who really are just pet lovers, lovers of those connected to us, close to us through familial ties, animal lovers who specific animal who love specific animals but don't expend, extend our sympathies to far away animals, for example, in factory farms. Part five, hope. I believe that despite what we do in the academy, there is hope. Animals are unruly. Animals refuse to be objectified in or outside of academia. Animals always exist outside of the text. There's always a gap into which the animal bleeds. Animals are all around us. Yes, we are truly enmeshed in their violence, and they in ours. But that doesn't mean we can stop caring, stop loving, and look the other way. Instead, we can make what Falkenheim calls a turning towards, an ethics of motion towards an encounter, a willingness to situate oneself so as to be available to the call of others. It is a willingness toward dialogue, a willingness toward responsibility, a choice for encounter and response, a turning toward rather than turning away. I end with Henry Salt's words again. It is difficult to maintain perfect love for animals so long as we continue to eat them. I think we in animal studies have a responsible to turn toward the consequences of our work and aspire to live as loving and compassionately as possible. And I see that compassion as an endless work in progress a process of doing the best we can to minimize damage, minimize violence, exploitation, domination, and objectification, wherever and whenever we can. And I see veganism as part of that practice. <laughs>